Well, welcome back everyone uh, for the after lunch session of the FP Miniconf. Uh, up now we have Ken Scambler from REA Group who will be presenting his talk data made out of functions and uh, following, the, uh, I'll leave that till after. So without further ado, here's Ken. Thanks everyone. Right, space bar. So uh, Diogenes of Sinope was an ancient Greek philosopher and he's famous for being the simplest man of all time. He lived in a barrel, he didn't have any possessions except for a single bowl to drink water out of and he doled out unwanted philosophical advice to passers-by. Uh, famously, um, once he saw someone drinking water out of their cupped hands and then he realised he didn't need the bowl anymore and so he threw it in the bin and had no possessions instead. I sometimes wonder if we gave Diogenes a laptop, what programming language he'd, he'd choose. <laughs> so, certainly not Scala, I think, but um, probably not any of the other ones there either. Now, uh, so all of these languages have different features, and uh, I think Diogenes would be saying, well, do we really need all of these features? What can we do without? So strings are pretty much arrays. We, we don't really need a, a first-class string feature. Uh, we don't really need a while loop because we can do that with recursion, just calling the same function over and over. Um, we don't need a first class list structure because if we have recursive data structures, we can just create lists from first principles. We don't really need booleans because we can sort of simulate that with integers like we do in C. And so you keep throwing away all, all these things and, and eventually you might think you've got some primitives that you just need to have to be able to build a, a real programming language out of if then else you know, an integer type or something like that, a way to build uh, data structures out of uh, and a function type. But it turns out you can throw all of these away and uh, build everything, the whole world of computation out of just one feature, um, lambda functions. And so it turns out all of those other things can just be done with, with lambda functions. So this is the programming language Diogenes would use. Uh, and that's the lambda calculus, which, which is a kind of a programming language that was invented before there were even computers by Alonzo Church in the 1930s. And it's, in a sense, it's one of the, the, the theoretical foundations of, of computer science. It, it's, uh, any program that can be expressed can be expressed in the lambda calculus built out of just this one concept, a, a, an anonymous function from, from a, a, an argument to a value. And so all, all of the functional programming languages today, like um, Haskell and Scala and so forth, uh, the lambda calculus forms uh, a core part of their intellectual heritage. Now, I'm going to be talking about a part of that today, and that is uh, a really cool aspect that we can actually build any data structure just out of functions. So we don't need a primitive int type or a primitive Boolean type or a, or a way to even build data structures. We can just fake the whole thing just out of, made out of functions. And that's a really cool thing on its own, um, but it's, uh, it also has some practical applications and, and so I'll, I'll go over some of the, the motivation as well. So first of all, let's think about Booleans. They're a very simple structure. It's just something that can be true or false. And the church encoding of that, that is to say, this expressed as a function is simply taking the bull to a result. And there's a sort of a philosophical point for, for what this really means here. Uh, because if we can define everything you can do with a structure, is that any different from just defining the structure itself? What does it even mean to define a structure uh, separately from all the things that you can do with it? And this is kind of what this function signature means. So a Boolean um, is either true or false. And if you want to do something with a Boolean, if you know what to do when it's true and you know what to do if it's false, th then you know what to do with the Boolean. So, so if we pick something to do when it's true, pick something to do with it's false, then, uh, then we can encode it as a function. We can break this down a little bit because true and false are singletons and that means they carry no information. It's uh, like unit to result. Um, but, of course, a function from unit is just the same as just having that value in the first place. So, so really it looks more like this. And this gives us the church encoding for a Boolean, R to R to R. And so in, 
uh, current form, this means uh, we can think of this as having two inputs, an R and an R, and it returns an R. And it doesn't matter what R is, whatever type, um, that's the signature. Now, how many different implementations of this function do you think there are? Carrying on from, uh, from Tony's talk on parametricity. What, what was that? Uh, no type constraints, just, it's just for all, for all R. How many different implementations of the function are there? Exactly, two. Because we don't know what R is, we have two R's and we have to return one of them. So either we can return the first one or the second one. And of course, there are also two values of Boolean. So you can see that this function signature is isomorphic to Booleans. There's two of these and there's two Booleans. So it is, uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between this and Booleans. So it's legit. Uh, and, and what's interesting is we can build all of the things that we do with Booleans, all of Boolean logic, uh, we can make that uh, just out of this signature. So here's an example of uh, some Haskell code. Uh, okay, the desktop thing doesn't work when you're in full screen with double screens. Hang on. All right, so um, th this is Haskell here. Up here we have the signature, um, ball equals for all r, r to r to r. So the for all r, that just means that when we have an instance of this function, we don't pick that type ahead uh, of time. Um, any in instance of the function, when you run it, you can pick a different value of r each time you run it. So that, that's what that's saying. And as you can see, uh, we can immediately implement true and false, uh, where x and y are the two parameters. True is we just return x, and false is we just return y. And then we can implement not, and and, or, and all that kind of stuff. Cool, so this is a, a Haskell command line. So here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> So if we do that, um, true and not true is false. True and true is true. True or not true is true. So we're doing Boolean logic here. We're building a program out of Booleans, but there's no Booleans. It's all functions all the way down. There's no if-else structure. There's no uh, primitive types, it's, it's all just functions. So that's kind of cool. This uh, gives you a hint of the, the, the power that, that functions give you. So I'll, I'll uh, all right, how do we get out of this? There we go. And, okay. So natural numbers, now this is a different one again. Um, you might think that this has to be represented as some kind of primitive in, in your programming language, but again, we can break it down. For the natural numbers, starting with zero and counting up one, two, three, three, four, five, not two threes, you know what I mean. <laughs> I, on, of all the things in the talk, I did not think I would make a mistake with that bit. <laughs> so, so we can represent this as zero, then zero plus one, zero plus one plus one, and, and so forth like this. And so we can define all the natural numbers just with two primitives, a zero value, and then a successor function that takes you to the next one. And um, this was discovered by Giuseppe Piano uh, 100 years ago-ish, and he invented a data structure to represent this that we call Piano numbers. And, and so it's either zero or uh, a successor function of some other number. And so it's a recursive structure this time. And now that we've got a structure, we can turn that into functions. So we can represent all of the, um, the natural numbers with functions. And if we can represent the natural numbers with functions, we can represent all of the integers as well. Because even though it seems like zero and the positive integers is, is, is half the size of all the integers, in fact, they're exactly the same number. They're both uh, a countably infinite set. So defining this actually means we're defining it for all countably infinite things. Um, so. Once again, first of all, um, we need to say, if, if we want to say, what do we do with the number? We need to say, what do we do if it's a successor? And what do we do if it's zero? And then if we know how to handle both of those cases, then we know how to handle the whole. 
So once again, uh, we can unwrap these a bit. Zero is a singleton, so it's just a, like this, really. Um, and then nat, the successor is just a, a contains a, a natural number. The, uh, the singleton, we can lose that, um, as we discussed before. But nat, that's interesting, because that's a recursive value. The whole thing we're trying to do is encode nat as a function, but we're back to the drawing board, because we've got another nat in, in the middle of the definition. And that's going to recurse all the way down to infinity. Um, but the trick here is, uh, because we're encoding that as uh, s some other result, where we're taking it to a result, we can just replace that recursive value with the result, because that's what it's going to re resolve to in the end. And so this is the, the signature we get. R to R, so a, a function from R to R, then an R, and then you get returned an R. So, so there's two arguments, one's a function, Second one is that, uh, and the last one is R. So, so how you read this, though, is this is the successor function. This is a value that you provide in place of zero, and then that's your final result for whatever you're trying to do with it. So let's, um, uh, let's take another look at the Haskell version, because we can do a bunch of cool stuff there, too. Uh, church now. Cool. So once again, we see this definition uh, as, as discussed. It's that just that. And so we can encode all the numbers. We've got one, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And once again, there's this sort of philosophical point of, of this uh, abstract concept of what a number means separately from the specific mathematical thing. So, so number 3 is not just the number 3. It could mean... Three dollars in your wallet, it could mean jumping up and down three times. It could mean uh, putting three rocks in a bucket. And that's kind of what the church definition captures. It's, it's performing an action that many times. And so uh, we look at, so, so it takes a function and a zero value, and the definition of zero is it just ignores the function and returns zero. The definition of one, it calls the function once. Definition of two is it calls the function twice and so on. So, so the church encoding of an int, um, or, or a natural number rather, is just calling a function that many times. It's just doing, doing something that many times. Uh, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, and once again, we can implement addition and multiplication and do all kinds of arithmetic uh, just using functions without any kind of primitive idea of what addition means or integers means or, or anything like that. So if we go here and go load church nat. Uh, so, so, so now we can do uh, C2, C plus, C3. Uh-oh. I, um, what was my thing? C nat to uh, int. All right, cool. So, so now we're doing arithmetic. If we um, change that to multiplication, yeah. So we've just rebuilt arithmetic out of nothing, just out of this primitive concept of, of a lambda function, which is kind of cool. Uh, now I'll go back to, you yeah. know, Okay, so at this point you might be thinking, okay, that's, that's all cool, um, but what's it for? What, it, what do I do with it? And, and that's an interesting point, and, and I'm going to illustrate the point of why this can be a useful thing by showing you how crap it is. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if we compare the performance of these representations of a number, well, machine integers just blow everything away. They're really, really fast for anything you want to do with them, addition, multiplication, whatever. Uh, piano numbers, where we have the, the data structure with the successor, are rubbish because anything you want to do with, do with it, it's got to bubble through, bubble, 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 and it, it will take time proportional to how big the integer is, which is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> and church numbers are, uh, are much the same. They're, they're a little bit better because uh, in the addition and multiplication cases, what we're doing is we're, we're actually not doing any work. We're just composing the functions together. And the work only gets done later when we finally observe the result and, and print it. But it only has to do that work once and not over and over, and over again. But still, at the end of the day, uh, <laughs> not even too good. And the other two are, are rubbish. Now, 
What this illustrates, though, is that what we've done, we've rewritten the structure into, into a representation that's logically, provably identical and isomorphic uh, with the same meaning in every way, but with a radically different performance profile. Now, in this case, that sucks. But in other cases, that can be really, really valuable. So in other cases, and, and I, I'm not going to go into, there's some more advanced ones that I, that I won't cover in, in the talk, but, but the basic intuition is sometimes uh, in the operations you want to perform on a structure, you might have to do something expensive like bubbling through and, and doing everything step by step by step. Using a church representation, often what happens is these, these operations become simple function composition, which is instantaneous, and then the work only has to be done, be done once at the very end rather than many, many times in between. And so... There, in functional programming, there are many, many tools that you build up uh, to rewrite a data structure in a provably isomorphic way that changes the, the memory usage or the performance. And these are really, really useful techniques. This is just one of, of many. Um, so we've seen a couple of examples now. And so uh, we can build up a, a bit of a pattern here. Uh, so so this is, these are some simple rules that you can use to mechanically translate any data structure that's composed of these elements into just functions. So a, um, a single value uh, gets taken to a result. So it gets encoded as A to R, to the, where R is the result. A or B, well, you have to tell it, how do I take A to a result, and how do I take B to a result? That means I can take the whole thing to a result. That's in the, um, what the last two examples were doing. When we have A and B in an ordered pair like this, uh, we have to take both of these to a result at once, and then that gives us the result. So, so this is in curried form. Um, is everyone familiar with cu currying? Uh, is everyone not familiar with currying? Um, okay, so, uh, now, so, so this here, A to B to R, that's uh, logically the same thing as saying A and B to R. So if you imagine uh, A and B like that to, to R, so in conventional languages, um, usually the arguments will be written sort of like this in a, in a tuple and then only to the result as, as a sort of a different thing. But you can always encode this as uh, A to B to whatever to, to the result. And, and you read this as they're all arguments until the last one, which is the return type. So it's, it's a function from A, A and B to, to R. That's how you, you read that. So the singletons, because um, a singleton, like, like um, the empty list or, or uh, the zero case, uh, because it doesn't carry any information, we just provide, we have to nominate a result value to represent that. Uh, and then, of course, recursion, we swap in the result itself and do that. So following these simple rules, you can encode any structure just in terms of functions. Now... Um, haven't got for time, Fraser. Yes. Awesome. So I'm going to go through another example of lists, which is uh, slightly more interesting, but it's actually pretty similar to the last ones. And so um, hopefully you'll be seeing some patterns but by now uh, and seeing some repetition in the way that we do this. So in almost every functional language, there's a, a structure called a cons list, which represent lists as a bunch of cells. So in each one, there's a, what's called a cons cell, it comes from Lisp originally, where it's got an element in the list and a pointer to the next cell and so forth. So you've got different elements in the list, and this would go forever, so you need a, a, an empty list at some point to terminate the sequence. So the set of lists, it's, it's the, the empty list, uh, or uh, a one, or, or a con cell that points to the empty list, or a con cell that points to a con cell that points to the empty list, and, and so forth. And that sort of builds up inductively like the other data structures that we looked at. So like this, so we've got a con cell with uh, a head and a tail, which is a list, or nil, which is the empty list. And so uh, once again, we want to take both of these cases to the result, and um, uh, then we get the final result. Nil is a singleton, so it's just like unit, and once again, we can throw it away. The recursion we can replace with the result, and then our pair will carry that, and we, we get that. So then that becomes our church encoding of a list. Now, if you've done any functional programming before, you might recognize this type signature. This is fold R. So most functional languages have some idea of a fold, a fold right or fold left over, over a list. 
which allows you to break it down uh, piece by piece and squish it into a, into a single value. And what's interesting is it's not just an operation you can perform over a list. Foldar is the list, in a sense. And so all of these church encodings are essentially folds over the respective data structures. Uh, so I have, oops, yeah, got it. Uh, edits. Da, 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 da. Church list, yeah. So, um, yeah, once again, we've got our fold signature, which is a list. And once again, we've got so nil, cons, and we can build up a whole lot of things out of that. I haven't implemented any more functionality there because I got bored and it was late last night. <laughs> uh, but you get the picture. So um, once again, we can build everything that you can possibly do with a list, you can build with this uh, encoding of a list. Um, so, uh, we got, yeah, so, so to, to take away uh, from this talk, uh, I'd like you to take away that, oh, yeah. I've lost the mouse pointer. Okay. Lambda functions, therefore everything. <laughs> That's the point. And, and uh, as you learn functional programming, you sort of hit a, uh, a series of these kind of aha moments, these sort of revelations where something really hits you. And this was one of, this is one of my favorite ones that, that I hit, was just w when I realized how deep the rabbit hole goes. And functions, you can just build everything out them. They're, they're a building block that can just give rise to everything imaginable that you can express in a computer program, uh, even down to the, the data structures and, and data types. And uh, even though that's amazingly cool, it also happens to be uh, a useful uh, concept every, every now and then in programming in that it's one more way to rewrite a data structure in a way that's provably identical with a different performance profile that is sometimes beneficial. But I think the most important thing here is it's just awesome. And <laughs> functional programming is just really cool. And, and there's so many little, ha little revelations and delights like this uh, and I, I hope I've tempted you into maybe digging deeper in, into some of these ideas um, because there are uh, many more like this uh, awaiting you. Uh, thank you for your time. We have about five minutes for questions. If you want to shout it out in ten. Um, yeah. Again, not a question. Um, <laughs> Oh, sure, if you go over the uh, 2 to the 32 yeah, yeah. sort of thing. Oh, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. right. And the other thing is, that suggests there's this kind of program where you just kind of, I mean, it's a program, maybe at any of these programs, where you investigate all simple type signatures and see whether they're useful. It's sort of like, you know, going out into the rainforest and getting all these plants and checking them to see whether they do all different things. And just keep them um, so, so what, what was the... We the intent of the comment. Let's generate all the simple type signatures and start to see is this type signature we've generated do something useful? Like is it a list or is it boolean? Um, do you see what I'm saying? No. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Does anybody see what I'm saying? Like you could just investigate all simple type signatures and say is this an interesting one? Like if using this technique, do you mean? Or, or you can do it the other way around. Like we know what a list is. Yeah. Yeah. Like sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So uh, Boom with R2R2R. Yeah, sure. So if you do R2R2R2R, and what does that, does that match to the value type that you just mentioned? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so if you want to do this kind of experimentation where you just pick random type signatures and see how you rewrite them, which is actually a pretty neat thing to do because often this actually comes in handy when you've got a particular data structure, is to learn about um, algebraic data types and, and type algebra. And you can actually, I, I know, yeah, here we go. We, we, um, 
uh, a, f a, flinch, a flinch here at the word algebra. Um, <laughs> but but um, expressing, expressing things in this way, you can um, rewrite things equationally and treat it as, as actually a very simple mathematical equation where so function signatures are equivalent to exponentiation. Uh, uh, tuples are, are, are like products, and then we have sum types, which are like sums, uh, and that in much the same way that you would rewrite equations with with exponents and products and sums, uh, you can do that with with data types, um, and and this is sort of uh, all, all connected to that to that idea, yeah. Uh, up the bank. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, so one that one one that comes up um, a lot is uh, the the case of free monads, um, which I it's like, you know, this is an introductory talk, right? So, um, but but the general principle is a free monad is a um, uh, it gets used uh, as a in in regular programming as a really brutally effective way to separate concerns in the code base, um, so that you. Uh, just say what you want to do um, declaratively and then you have an interpreter at the very end of the program that, that interprets the commands in this sort of language that you have to find. But, but what it ends up implementation wise, it ends up uh, as a kind of a tree structure um, where every time you do a, a, a monadic bind, um, or every time, let's say every time you want to perform an action on it, it, it goes bubble, 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 bubble all the way through the tree. Um, and then if you're doing n actions, then it's gonna, you're going to get sort of n squared performance. You're going to bubble, bubble, bubble each time, and it just gets bigger as you, you keep sort of doing things to it. Uh, the church encoding, on the other hand, um, that allows you to, every time you do an action, actually it just instantaneously composes the functions and doesn't do anything. And then finally, at the end of the program, when you finally want to interpret this, this syntax tree that you've built up, um, it's, then it finally does the bubble, 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 and unrolls it. But um, it only does that once instead of every single time you want to do an action. So, so that's um, maybe going into a bit more detail. I, maybe, I hope you can see why I, I maybe didn't think I, I wanted to include a, go into too much detail, but yeah. yeah. Uh, Fraser. Yeah, is there a correspondence between church encoding and a uh, continuation passing style? Like is, is, is CPSing um, a computation or, or a structure uh, equivalent to applying church encoding? I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about continuations. Oh, yeah, sorry. The, um, so, the, so the question was, is there a correspondence between church encoding and continuation passing style um, in the way that they can express um, computations or structures? And Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you.